Well, I'm shooting these videos with my bib overalls on because we Jen shot a nice buck last night. We recovered him this morning and he had his stained tarsal glands in the back. We found open scrapes this morning and it's just on the cusp of the second rut. And, uh, you know, first we talk about in another video, you have to believe the second rut is an actual thing. And it is. It's very, very important. And you really want to fast forward about four weeks from your rut lockdown date, which is early November around here, last couple days of October sometimes, early November. And that's where that ramp up of does are taking place that coming into estrus and bucks are waiting they're not on does because they haven't been coming in and all of a sudden a bunch of does come in all the bucks get on does because there's a lot more does and bucks and does get missed because bucks are with does for two or three days before they actually breed them and finish the process then you get in the peak rut that's more random and you can have does missed then too but boy there's a lot in a bunch missed and you go back to early november it's december 4th right now you go back four weeks and that was about that time now right in early november and so we believe that it takes place and it's a huge opportunity for you. It, to me, I talk about the second rut being the most missed time in the deer woods every single year. Jen took advantage of last night with a nice buck. I was probably participating in running activities, hanging out with some does, feeding. And I know you can too, but here's some of the kind of the rules of that second rut, strategies that I follow, tips that have helped me throughout the years. And it's at a favorite time of mine to hunt. Not a lot of hunters out in the woods, hardly any. It's muzzleloader season. There's snow on the ground at times. In fact, Dylan found the blood this morning from the buck that we recovered, and it was in some snow. It ran across an open alfalfa field, a little bit of green mixed in, a bunch of grass, hardly any snow. Very, very hard to find blood, especially with a gunshot, you know, a muzzleloader shot. A lot of times they don't bleed for 50 yards, 100 yards, unless you get a complete pass through. Jen actually perfectly shot hers, meeting mid-body all the way up. She's shooting uphill at the buck, ended up just behind the, sh the shoulder on the opposite side, right in the rib cage. We got the sabot back. So she took out the heart, the guts, unfortunately, going in, at least one lung. So probably the liver. Uh, I know the liver. So there was a lot of damage, and he went about 150 yards and got into the brush, and he was, what, Dylan, 10 yards in? I mean, 20 yards at the most? Yeah. Found where he bedded down, which means probably fell down, and... And then I got up from there and didn't make it very far. So probably a really quick process. But again, second rut opportunity this time of year, not just the normal activity. So what do you look for? Where do you hunt? And first, morning rut stand. What's a morning rut stand anyways? You know, people have them on a small food plot somewhere. On a food source in general, a corner of an ag field. Those aren't rut stands. They're thinking, well, deer move through here during the rut. Morning rut stands to me have to do with bedding areas, whether they're buck bedding, doe bedding, not in the bedding, but off to the side where you can safely approach those, blow your wind into a safe direction on the outside of the, the bedding area, and sit back and see what happens in the morning. My favorite times to hunt. Not all stands are created equal. Has to be, to me, next to a bedding area. I would say 70% of my bucks account for this. Somewhere around there where I'm hunting these morning rut stands and waiting for deer to come back. That morning rut stand, downwind edge of budding bedding areas that are currently being used by bucks either traveling through for does or actually being used for a buck. And this bedding area could be five acres, 10 acres. I'm not talking a deer bed. That's not a very good tactic to try to find a deer bed and sit over it and wait for a buck to come back. That works in low pressure states where you bump a buck, wait for him to come back the next day, set up on him. That works someplace. It doesn't work in the Midwest, doesn't work in the Northeast, doesn't work in the central part of the country where you actually have hunting pressure. Might work in Kansas, Iowa locations, Nebraska, South Dakota. If there's areas that you can find that even Iowa can have high hunting pressure areas. But if you find those low pressure areas, some of those tactics can be golden. But I hunt morning bedding areas during the rut. Wait for those deer to come back to you. I want to make sure I can get in and out without spooking deer. So the cool thing about hunting a bedding area stand in the morning is you can see what deer are behind, around you. You're sitting there for three or four hours. You know, if they're moving through, feeding through, and you get out when the getting's good. Problem is you go in that stand in the afternoon, you know what's there, and a lot of times you just end up spooking deer. So I want to be able to get in and out without spooking deer. I want to be on the edge of a bedding area, and I want my scent blowing away from those bedding areas. That's a, a morning rut stand to me. And I say morning rut stand because I'm typically, typically not hunting that area outside of the rut. So I'm looking at early December, mid-December to where you're at in the country, a little bit later down in Tennessee, might be the third week of December. Uh, Virginia, same thing, middle of December. 
But bottom line is you're seeing that rutting activity place and then take place and then you're going into that rut stand. I don't want to go in there before because the deer are usually already there, especially a buck that's recovering from the primary rut and just trying to conserve energy. Once the rut takes place, you don't know where he's at in the morning, just like the peak rut, rut lockdown, pre-rut. You don't know where they're at, so you can get in in the morning. They're usually out making rub scrapes, chasing does, chasing other bucks off. They're very active, which means you can get in and slip in in the morning, just like you can during the second rut. I want to make sure to let you guys know that our friends at Quiet Cat are offering a major discount for our viewers here on the channel. Just go to the link in the description. It's a giant savings, and uh, it's just in time for Christmas. Afternoon bedding. Think about an afternoon bedding staging area. Shot some really nice bucks 300 yards away from food. He was moving towards food. He's coming out of his bedding. He's within 100 yards of his bed. You're waiting for him to come out. It's an area usually with a lot of rub, sign, scrape. Sometimes we have water holes in that area. Getting out of their bedding, moving through this area. And then once they leave that area, they're typically just walking straight to their food source. Safe cover to get there. So think about it as like a food source staging area. That's the last safe patch of cover before a buck exits to go to a food source. Great place too. But a lot different than a bedding area staging. Bedding area staging is more remote. In this time of year, a lot of times those bucks aren't moving until the last little bit of light, even during the second rut. They're going to go find does after dark out in that food source. So I like if you can get back to a bedding area and you say, I know I can get back here to this point. But boy, on the other side of that ridge, that's where he's at. Or around that corner in that swamp, that's where he's at. Maybe in that middle of that clear cut, that's where he's at. I can get to the edge, but I'm not going to go sit in it. I can get to the edge of the ridge, but I'm not going to go over the top and get into that location. So an area where you can get close to him and you're waiting for him to come out. Now he might go a different direction. Bucks are under, unpredictable. They're not like does. So I really like that staging area, bedding area, staging area. And then, of course, the food source itself. The cool thing about the food source itself compared to a bedding staging is you can, if you're hunting it safe with a muzzleloader, for example, from a distance, or you're hunting a corner of the food source as they exit and go out to a big food source that's hidden, then you can hunt that area over and over again as long as you can get in and out without spooking deer and you can blow your scent safely. And that's why in a big food source, it's almost impossible to sit with a bow. You sit there one time, now you just ruin the entire, the entire hunt, the entire movement. So afternoon food source movements, either that bedding area, staging area, where you're not getting into the bed, you're getting close to where you know you can get in safely and then seeing if he comes out. But the more conservative approach is to sit and watch that food or off to the side of the food so you can check for that movement going to that food source. The thing is you can't spook out either. You can't spook out the bedding area, you can't spook out the... Uh, food source movement or you're, you're done. Those bucks will just go somewhere else. They have lots of choices where they can go safely, meaning they don't mind going three miles, two miles, a mile to find it. Does or homebodies, they'll go a half mile and just move around the corner or something. But bucks have five or six times a home range and they'll go find that. Afternoon food source is not all created equal. Just because you have a big, beautiful food plot, a standing ag field, a great clear cut on public land, maybe a swamp edge, maybe an upland cover habitat with lots of briars, stem count. That doesn't mean deer are going to be there. I want to make sure it's unpressured. And when I say unpressured, I mean by you or by anybody else. Now, if your neighbor is 300 yards away making some noise, that's not necessarily pressured because they can get to that food source and leave and they never see another person. You spook them one time thinking, well, I'm just going to go... I can't tell you how many people I see with rednecks and really super nice blinds on a food plot. Folks, if you can't get in and out of your blind or stand next to that food source, it's pressured. I don't care if you think, well, I only use it once a week. That's too much. Maybe you can get away with it once every five, six weeks, but who of us has all these resources spent of food source and blind and stand just blow it out every four or five weeks. I like to hunt more than that. So what I do is, and, and even then, where do they go? Do they go to your neighbors to get shot? That's how you reduce the age structure in your area of bucks by spooking deer off food sources. It doesn't even matter if it's once a month. Yeah, maybe you can get a good hunt out of it once a month. That's not enough to me. So by all means, you can't pressure your food sources ever. Number two, it's gotta be good food. Notice how I put unpressured before good food. Unpressured food source that's adequate is better than a good food source that's pressured. It always wins when it comes to mature bucks. Now you might have a bunch of does running around. That's why I put does last. Obviously, if you don't have does coming to this food source, why would a buck come there? And it's not because he's going there because of the does. It's just that the does aren't going to eat that food source. If they're not going to be out there, why would a buck eat it? The does are telling you, yeah, they like this food source, a good food source. Planted food plots on private land, 
combination of good browse in the woods on private land, clear cuts on public land, swamp edge, diversity of habitat where old timber meets young timber meets upland habitat. The more diversity you find in public land, the more deer you're going to find, the more wildlife in general. Sometimes good food sources. A standing cut cornfield, standing, meaning they haven't plowed it under. It's not necessarily a good food source. Deer might come out to it every night, but they can find better typically somewhere. It has to be hidden. If you watch cars go by in the distance, if you see your neighbor walking out in his backyard, if deer can see you walking by in and out to a food source or to a stand location, even if you're not hunting right there, a quarter mile away, they can see your flashlight across the field, it isn't hidden enough. Number four, second rut. Hunting means rut sign. If you have rubs and scrapes around that food source, it's hidden, it's good food, and it's unpressured, guess what? You're going to not only have does, number five, but you're probably going to have the oldest bucks in the neighborhood because when it comes to this time of year, it's pretty easy to find a good food source because there's hardly any, so they really stick out. Food plots, ag fields, hay out in the fields, alfalfa is all dried out, stemmy and yellow. There's not a lot of good food sources. You have lots of great properties that are rut properties. They're not thick enough or have the stem count to support daytime browse for bedding, mature bucks, or does in general, deer in general, during December, January, February, March. They're really not available, so the ones that are there really stick out. It's kind of like uh, UP Michigan where I like to hunt on public land. Unless you're around a bait pile, you don't find a lot of sign. So when you find one rub out in the funnel that's a really nice rub, looks like a mature buck, it means something greatly. They might, not, they might only hit that rub twice a year. But what it tells you is there's a mature buck there because there's not a lot of sign. Not a lot at all. So when you have a good food source, you have does on it, which is least important. There's rut sign around it. It's hidden, good food, unpressured. You're going to have mature bucks around it. And it's an incredible spot to hunt for the second rut and build your entire hunt because if they're beating here, they're obviously bedding adjacent. They don't travel that far this time of year to their favorite food source. So you can count on not only having that great food source, but that sets up that entire structure where you have movement, bedding staging area, food, food source staging areas. You have bedding area stands for morning. You have evening stands, afternoon stands around that food source. It sets the entire table. Again, not all foods is created equal, and that's why there's very few food, source, food sources this time of year in food plots ag land, areas on public land that have been pounded that actually set the table for movement for mature bucks and deer in general for the entire day, entire season, entire second rut. You find those food sources, build your hunt around these tips right here and you'll have a great second rut. You gotta believe in it first, but once you do, you'll have a great second rut and you'll be able to count on that during a time when there's hardly any other hunters in the woods for the rest of your life. I appreciate you guys watching the YouTube channel, but I don't know if everyone knows everything that we have to offer, whether it's on whitetailhabitatsolutions.com, our website, or WHS Wildlife Blends, our seed company. Also, Instagram you can check out. I'm very active on Instagram, putting strategies on there, photos of what we do every day. Uh, much more active there than Facebook. But our seed, web classes, books, clients, Articles, I have over 600 articles on whitetailhabitatsolutions.com, everything whitetail strategy. Of course, we have hats on there, and then make sure to check us out on Instagram again. But lots of stuff to offer. We're always coming out with new things, and this isn't the end of it. We have more things coming soon. Make sure to check us out.